the things that could have taken us down, Lord. Thanks to you, Father, we can stand strong and say, Lord, we love you. Lord, we magnify your name. We just honor you this morning, Father. Lord, if there's nothing else we'd rather do is to be in your presence, Father.
praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you, Judah, for an awesome praise and worship service. Now we're on to our next part, which is our Holy Communion. And we do this in remembrance of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. Uh, we take this cup here that has the cracker and the juice, the cracker which represents the body and the juice which represents God's blood. Okay, but before we partake of this, we need to ask God to forgive us for our shortcomings, for whatever thoughts we had, our stinking thinking that can really kill us. Um, because we all fall short during the week, whether, like I said, it's, it's to do with just thinking, thinking something that you have said, something that you might be going through with a family member. It all starts here before we partake. We need to ask for forgiveness and make sure that we're cleansed from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. And before we go ahead and partake, I have a few scriptures and uh, found in 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to start from 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eat it and drink it unworthily, eat it and drink it damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So before we take this cup, again, we need to check ourselves and make sure that we're right in God's sight. So before we go ahead and take our communion, let us all bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for this time that you have given me to bring your holy communion. I pray, Lord, that you will bless this bread that represents your body and this juice that represents your blood. I pray, Lord, that you forgive me for anything that I have said, done, and thought and wash it under your blood. I pray that you will cleanse me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, Father. And I pray, Jesus, that you will just forgive me and continue to be with us through, through the remainder of this night and throughout this week and the days to come. This I ask in your name. Go ahead and eat your cracker. And go ahead and take your juice, which represents God's blood. Okay, let us all bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we had. Once again, to take your Holy Communion, I pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with us through the remainder of this night. Touch our pastor, Lord, that as our pastor comes forth and brings the word, it'll be edifying to each and every one of us, Father. And I pray that you will let us take it in to our hearts, Lord, and apply it to our daily lives. I pray that you will continue to strengthen each and every one of us and top, touch us from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. I bind and I rebuke every sickness that's trying to come upon our body because we belong to you. I commit everything into your hands this night and wash it under your blood. In your name I ask this all. Amen. Have a good night. Praise the Lord. We're going to jump right into our word this morning night. The title of our message is I Declare War. I Declare War. Every day of our lives, in our lives, we battle. Do we know that we are at war? And if we do, who do you think you are at war with? 
Do you think it's someone you meet in off the streets? Or do you think it's something else? This morning I'm here to tell you you battle in war with yourself. With ourself. The Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground and we must be on guard at all times. Before we even jump into the, this idea of declaring war, we have to acknowledge this reality. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are in a war. And you cannot win a battle you won't admit you are in. The Christian life is a war of fighting to live in the spirit and not in the flesh. It's simple. We got to admit in our daily life that we are fighting against our own flesh. We see things, we hear things, our flesh arises. We get upset in the morning. So we wake up, we upset. Why? Because we hear bickering between our kids. Or, you know, if you're married, you and your husband and was arguing and you went to sleep angry. That's battling with your flesh. That's what the enemy wants. He wants us to battle against our flesh so that he can win. When our mind is occupied in battling with ourself, that's when the enemy come in. He take what he like. He take what is not his. And we allow it. Why? Because we don't recognize it. Because why our, our eyes are clouded. We are blinded. That's why it says our Christian life is not a player. It's not. To stay in our Christian life daily, there are steps we have to take. We have to first realize that we are battling against the, the spirit. It's a spirit that we are battling with. But we got to declare war with ourselves. Because without us saying self die, we're not allowing the spirit of Jesus Christ to resurrect in us because we are keeping him at a distance because our flesh is alive. In order for God to live in us, our flesh has to die. It says in Romans 7, 18 to 20, in the Amplified Version that I'm using, it says, for I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh, my human nature, my worldliness, my sinful capacity. For the willingness to do good is present in me. You see. To do good is in us. But are we activating the goodness in us? But the doing of good is not. Goodness is in us, but are we doing good? You see what I mean? Are we following a good path? Or are we doing whatever our flesh tells us to do? Do we know if it's good or not? Do you know if that is good or that is of bad nature? How will we do? We don't if we don't kill the flesh that's in us and resurrect the spirit of Christ. In 19 it says, for the good that I want to do and do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. You see what I mean? Flesh. We live with flesh daily. But yet, we can also live with the Spirit of God daily too. By dying our flesh to the Spirit of God. And when we do that daily, we can do what is good and not what is bad. Self-consciously, we know what is good and what is bad. Fleshly, we do what is bad and not good. Spiritually, we can do good all the time. But if I am doing the very thing that I do not want to do, I am no longer the one doing it. That is, it is not me that acts. It's not you, it's your flesh. 
but the sin nature which lives in me. You see, when God died, his flesh, when Jesus died, his flesh died. Flesh was made of man. Flesh is what carries sin. Your fleshly attitude, your fleshly mind, which is carnal minded, your, your fleshly body. But if we allow the spirit to resurrect above the flesh, that's when our actions becomes good. That's when our living becomes good. You see, if that tongue twister doesn't perfectly empathy, em, the, amplify the initial struggle bouncing around in all of our minds, I don't know what does. We are masters of getting in our own way. Yes, the devil hates you. Yes, the world is out to get you. But you've got enough going on under the hood to take yourself out of the game. You know what that means? We choose to do what we do. We choose to live the way we live. We choose to think the way we think. We choose to allow the flesh to override the spirit. It's a choice we make. That's why it says you can take yourself out. God gives us a choice. Who are you going to choose to declare war with? The flesh? The spirit. In order to declare war to be a winner, we have to acknowledge where the enemy is coming in. We have to first look it in the eye and say, Devil, I got your number. Dial it and allow God to help you. Your self sabotaging mechanism might be your negative thoughts. It might be your actions or lack thereof. Your bad behavior or short temper. It might be your harsh speech or the way you mindlessly turn to social media or food to distract yourself from what is really going on. We all have a vice. The problem isn't that we struggle with the things. The problems come when we refuse to acknowledge them. When we decide, it is easier to go quietly into the night instead of putting up a fight. How many of you are like that? Ah, let's just turn the other cheek, leave them alone and let them go. It don't work that way because it's gonna keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. When we turn away and walk away, it don't solve a problem. You're running away from it. You have to look at it dead in the eye and acknowledge them by saying, devil, I know that that's you. We have to make sure we equip. We gotta equip ourselves with the scriptures of the word. Because if you go out and forth and attack the enemy with nothing inside but a hollow shell, he gonna fool on, turn around and tell you who you. I don't know who you. We don't want that to happen to us. If you want to put up a fight, make sure you're ready for the war. I don't believe that we don't deserve victory in our lives. We do. We, be, we, be, we need victory. We are born to be victorious in the word of God. And when he wants us to be victorious in the word of God, that means he will be victorious in this world. Because God is the champion. He is the Judah, the Jehovah. If he's our Jehovah, why aren't we victorious? Why? No one wants to be stagnant, stuck in a rut of the same old, same old. It's just that we don't want to put in the hard work or to commit to God's instructions. That shows us the way we can live as victors. 
Our world offers lots of distractions to throughout the chaos caused by our unruly actions throughout our lives. But these fixes at their best are simply that distractions. Jesus offers something better. Stop letting the distractions cloud our judgment or block our vision. Yes, we have a vision in this house. We are the light to shine in the darkness. But how can you be the light if your own vision that God's showing you is clouded by things of this world? You want something to be answered in your life? Stay focused on the world. You want something to be done today? Stay focused on the world. Focus on Jesus Christ first. Then everything will fall into place. The first key is who we fighting against. Who are you fighting against? This is the day God brought you to this moment to declare a war on your darkness on your demons, on your self-sabotaging tendencies, on the version of yourself that you don't want to be. To throw off the gloves and rise to the fight, to commit to learning in as we tackle vital components of the inner struggle. Who are we fighting against? Ourselves our shortcomings, our fears. Why are you letting that get you? That's nothing compared to Jesus Christ. That is nothing. 2 Corinthians 10, 4-6 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for the pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to push all disobedience is fulfilled. It gives us our answer. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Ready up. Your mind is carnal thinking. That's what makes your whole being be afraid, worried, scared, anxiety. That's the enemy. That's a distraction that the devil uses to make yourself believe that that's what you have. And in you believing that, it stops you from getting to your victory. Stopping you from getting to your victory. Fate of a mustard seed can give you a lot. But if we have a carnal mind thinking, it cannot, it cannot overcome because you're allowing it to kill that mustard seed in you. But you know what? God could never let that happen. He will never allow that to happen. The only way the seed can die in you is if you allow it. You have to allow it. So what, who are you fighting against? Yourself, your mind, your thoughts, your thinking, your body, your actions. But my words say, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. That's a stronghold that we need to get rid of. It stops you. A stronghold is anything that stops you from getting to your point. Stopping you. Stop letting the enemy stop you. Kill him. That's right, kill him. Kill him with what? Scriptures. Kill him with the word of God.
hit them with the love of Jesus Christ. That's how you can get the enemy off the back. Killing them with Jesus. Key number two, insecurity. When we realize who we are fighting against, all these things come up. The very one is insecurity. Why? Because it makes you shame. You tend to get shame. Oh, I wonder what they're thinking of me. Who cares? Nobody knows what goes on in your life except you. Anything that come up against you is between you and God. Nobody else. If they're looking at you weird, look at them back weird. They give you one look, you give them one look too. But always remember, they don't know what's going on in your life. They might even be worse than you, but you will never know. That's how people are. They hide the insecurities. And then they start to hide behind the insecurity. So you know what, in the end, they're giving themselves away. They're giving themselves away. Just like when we, you know, October 31st, Halloween. People with costume, people with masks. So you know, see who that is. That's just like your insecurity. It's a mask that you wear to hide. But you know what? You're not hiding from the one person that's important, and that's Jesus Christ. He sees in and through you. What you hiding from the people for? You got to be hiding from Jesus Christ. But you know what? You cannot. You know why? He's brighter than that bright star. Anything that you feel that you need to hide, it's not hidden. It is not. Any insecurity that you think you have, I bind it in the name of Jesus. Because when Jesus Christ lives in you, there is nothing to hide. The people out there want to hide from you. Why? Because they see something different about you. You might have been hiding with them, but now that you have set yourself aside, you receive Jesus Christ, you allow his light to shine through, and in you, you have nothing to hide. And then we start to buy into the lies that we aren't good enough. Who telling you you're not good enough? The devil telling you you're not good enough. He uses that thought that you're never gonna make it. No matter how hard you're working, you're never gonna get it. No matter how much money you make it, it's never enough. That's the devil. Because my God provides all my needs. My God provides everything I need daily. Why I gotta be shameful? Why I gotta overwork myself? when I just put my life in God's hand. He's my maker. And he is also my boss. Looking at the life of Gideon and his journey from miserable insecurity to vulnerability and finally power. Gideon if you don't know, he was a man who had major insecurity. First off, he was tiny. He never thought anything good would come out of his life. Gideon was haunted by a low opinion of himself, low self-esteem. And it made him uncomfortable with who God called him to be. If you know the story of Gideon, he went into war with 300 men. Knowing that that wasn't enough, yet he obeyed God's law, God's calling upon his life. He obeyed what God told him to do, which left him with only 300 men against the Midianites, which was thousands of them. The story of Gideon comes in the book of Judges at the time when the people called the Midianites had taken control over the Israelites, God's people. 
They were super stressed out, as you can imagine, and they did something they hadn't done ever in their days of prosperity, which was to cry out to God. In response, God raised up what the Bible calls a judge. Gideon, who was a 90-pound man, was a deliverer God chose for his people. Gideon. At the time he was doing, when, when God called him, he was thrashing wheat in a wine press. If you know what is thrashing wheat, it's when you just pull, harvest the wheat and you needed to separate the outside from the inside. So he would pick up a pitchfork, pick up the, the wheat and throw it in the air and the wind would separate it. That's why he did it when it was windy. Okay? But because Gideon was, his insecurity overwhelmed him, he was threshing the wheat in the barn. He was inside instead of doing them outside. It showed what type of person he was. He allowed the thinking of others to overcome him. Yet, it said it, it was a windy place. Inside a barn, or in, like this, it's hot, right? No more wind coming in right now. Yet, in the barn he was in, God allowed it to be windy. It was the first thing that God was showing him. Yet he was still a bit blinded by his insecurity. See, it said the problem was Gideon was doing this inside when he's supposed to do it outside because of fear. It was in this moment that the angel of the Lord shows up and greets Gideon as a mighty warrior. Total opposite of how he looked and felt. When that happened, Gideon's insecurities showed up. But Gideon accepts the challenge and raises up an army. God planned by stocking the deck against Gideon in such a way that it would be unmistakable as to who the credit should go to when he was victorious. You see what I mean? Even in Gideon's insecurity, God showed up for him. God made him victorious with the amount of men in his army. Because why he listened to God instead of listening to his insecurity. When God tells you something, all you gotta do is show up for God because he will show up for you. If God called you to go out and minister and you said yes, but yet you nervous, God can take you there. God can give you what you need to get to the point where he wants you to. It happened for me. It happened for me. In my daily life when God said, you're it, I said, I guess so. But even in I guess so meant, yes, Lord. God brought me to the point where I'm at today. God took away all my insecurity. <laughs> Every day, from the time I was ordained till now, I'm nervous. I get nervous. God, am I doing what you want? God does. God does. I try to hide in my insecurity, but it don't work. It don't work. So what do I do? I have to call up God. And I have to allow Him to be that shield to block the insecurity, to attack me. If He does it for me, He can surely do it for me. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal mighty. But it is mighty for the strong pulling down of strongholds. 
God can move your insecure. Psalms 139.14 says, I will give thanks and praise to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Gideon was fearfully and wonderfully made at the end of this. His insecurity was long gone. God made him victorious. Wonderful are your works and my soul is well. If we allow God to start moving away things, we could know what he had done in our life. We will know that he is the answer to everything. We will know that he is our problem solver. He is our money maker. And he is our king of kings. Key number three was, is the way I speak. When God hears you speak about your car, when God hears you speak, and you start to complain, right? Oh, my car is crappy. Your kids are worried. My kids is ungrateful. My husband wife is lazy. My house is cramped. His response is, if you say so. You make what you say. Your kids had it, that's your fault. You spoke it, that means you know it. So that means you did it. Your car busts up, you have a choice. Whether to take God that is still there running or whether to lay it down in its own day. But you know what? Do you have money for a new one? If you don't, well, you better thank God. Your crappy car still run. <laughs> Even though the window got to go down because the air condition not working, you better be grateful that the bugs still run. Yes. <laughs> Your house messy, clean them up. Your house crappy, stop hoarding. Throw them away. Trust me, my house is pretty there. And it irritates me daily. To the point I just walk straight in my room. But that's my fault, because I allowed it. I'm not grumbling about it. I just look at it, shake my head, and I'll say nothing. <laughs> then I tell all, all the young ladies, oh, you guys gotta come help me to my house. But it never goes. The power of speaking, whether you speak good or whether you speak bad, you speak it. You want good to, be ha to happen in your life, speak good. You want prosperity to happen in your life? Speak wealth. You want your kids to go college and not come back but make something good of their life and take care of you? Speak it. Speak it. Right, Shirley? Right, right. Speak it. Because when you speak it, God hears it. And my word said, God answers prayer. God spoke the world into life. God spoke Jesus into our world. That tells you something about the weight of words. And it should humble you to know that God has given you the same power of speech. That is part of the privilege of being made in his image. You have great power in your speech that can unleash a forceful theory that create, tear down, build, heal, or hurt. Words has power. Speaking words has power. You got to remember, if you speak life, you will see life. If you speak death, you will Witness that. What you speaking on your life? Are you saying, Whew, I look beautiful this morning. Even though you don't feel it, but you say it. You speak in life. Every morning I wake up in a mirror and I tell myself, Jesus, I look skinny today. <laughs> and when I see myself, oh, I look skinny. But that's the eye of the beholder. If I say I'm skinny, I am skinny. If I say I'm beautiful, I know I'm beautiful. If you say you're weak, well, that's your problem. Your words tells you what you are. Your words break people 
or they build people up. If you want to work for God, we have to learn how to use words to build up. Because you know what? If you say you love Jesus Christ and Christ lives in you, yet when you go out there and try and witness to someone and you say opposite to them, who do you think you are? That's what they say to you. Because your speech and the way you speak to them is not of Jesus Christ. I am on fire. It is hot, but I am still beautiful. Speaking life brings life. Speaking death gives you death. We have to be careful with the way we speak. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth. But only such speech as is good for building up others. According to the need and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. The word of God tells us, speak of good and not of evil. Plain and simple. If you need a little bit more explanation, I don't know, what's your problem? But the word said, speak of good and not of evil. Proverbs 16.24 also said, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweet and delightful to the soul and healing to the body. When you start to speak life, you feel good as well as the other person you're speaking with. Your kid need licking, speak life. You did a good job, even though that's not what you wanted. They did it. You gotta remember that. They did it. You wanted it done this way? Maybe God told them to do it that way, but they did it. Speak life to them. And you know what's gonna happen? They're gonna start to change. They're gonna start to listen more. They're gonna start to obey more. They probably don't even introduce their boyfriend to you that they was trying to hide because they're not like you the Never know. Right, Lahela? <laughs> no. But God can increase them by just the way you speak to them. Key number four. Sorry, guys, I was up late and I started early. Start your day strong. When you get up in the morning, what do you do first? Is it giving God praise or are we overlooking Him? Well, we can't overlook God in preparation of our daily. Cannot stop. We gotta always give Him. We get up in the morning, we tell Him thank you because you know what? You don't have to breathe. He never had to give you life this morning, but he did. He not had to give you what you have daily, but he does. He blessed you with so much every day. A day of, to walk, to sing, to look, to breathe, to speak. All of that is gifts that we get from God. If we don't recognize him daily, he can start taking away things from us. And we don't want that to happen. You don't want to walk around all of a sudden, everything go dark. Everything go deaf. No more legs cannot walk, no more feeling. But you know how awesome my father is? He doesn't do that to me. Even if you're being disobedient, he don't do that. He continually gives us chance because he continually breathing his breath in us. So instead of instead of thinking, oh, we gotta go start to pray to Jesus. May pretend you put in makeup on your face. Thank you, Father, for the eyeliner. Thank you, Father, for the lashes. 
Thank you, Jesus, for giving me breath of life so that I can put makeup on and look beautiful. It works. You give your reverence to him daily. Thank you, Jesus, for the people who know how to do lashes for me. Make me sweat more, but thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the people who blow dry my hair. Help me style my hair more. Make me look more beautiful than I already is. It's a way that we can get to God. Thank you, God, for me being the star quarterback. Thank you, Jesus, for me being the top chef. Whatever works, whatever works, right? Let's give you God honor. Starting our day strong because we thank you. If we never thank him, we wouldn't be able to cook. If we never thank him, we wouldn't have what we have today. We wouldn't even have children. Because God is the seed blessing. It says in 1 Peter 1.13, So prepare your minds for action by completely sober in spirit, steadfast, self-disciplined, spiritually and moral alert. Fix your hope completely on the grace of God that is coming to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Start your day strong. Remember who he is in your life. From the moment you wake up to the moment you go put your head to rest. Just remember God that did it for you. Not me. Not Pastor Sini. Not Deaconess Tihani. But God. He did it for you. He woke you up, put food on your table, allowed you the strength that you have to go to work, pick up your kids, deal with them daily, then lay it down to rest. He provides you with your house, your car, your daily expense for living. God provided. Nobody else but God. And why? Because you started your day off with him. You ended your day with him. Amen, loved ones. The last key that I will leave you with is the Holy Spirit. This is war. A battle we cannot win alone. Every day we declare in war. When we fight for freedom from sin, declaring war can trap you in the same dark, helpless cage. The cage that says this is all a nice idea, but you'll never change. You'll never get through a day without yelling at your kids. You'll never beat the depression, the anxiety, or the vicious argumentative cycle with your other half. This is too much for you. We have enormous backup and firepower at our disposal. Do not try to fight these battles in your own strength or by relying on your own lung power. When your breath is taken away, you need to rely on God for a second wind. The first wind is the natural air that was given to you at creation when God breathed into the dust he formed us out of. The second wind is the power of the Holy Spirit that has given that was given to us after Jesus rose from the dead. See? God never, Jesus never only went back our war, I mean our freedom. When he left, he gave us a comforter who is the Holy Spirit. He is there to fight for us on our behalf. The Holy Spirit by our side can win back our victory. 1 John 4.13 says, By this we know with confidence and assurance that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us to us his Holy Spirit. He gave us his Spirit. It was a gift to us. Why not unwrap the gift and start using it? Because with him fighting on our behalf, he it can also, he can also 
or towards us for the future. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Every tongue which rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness for me is from me, says the Lord. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rise up against you in judgment shall fall. That was the promise of the Holy Spirit. John 20, 22 also says, and when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. You have received the Holy Spirit. What are you doing with it? Why are you declaring war with yourself if you have the Spirit of God? In order for have the Spirit of God work alongside you, God also equipped us with the whole armor of God. In Ephesians 6, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having gird your waist with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all preservation and supplication for all the saints with the holy spirit the whole armor of god works together it'll protect you against every fiery dot you know what is the fiery dot words Words. Words. Key number three, how we speak. Those are fiery doubts. But when you get the Holy Spirit and the armor of God, it protects you from the words. From getting shot from the front to the back, from the top to the bottom. It protects you. The Holy Spirit is our weapon to up, go up against the enemy. Jesus gave us the comforter because he knew he wasn't able to fight against the wells of the earth because we weren't able to fight. Because we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities. We're not fighting in the physical realm. We are fighting in the spiritual realm. We're not fighting against humans. We are fighting against the enemy, which is Satan and all his dark angels. And in order to fight against that, which is not of this world, but which is of the spirit world, we need something greater than our face. And that is the word of God. When we go up against Satan, we go up against him in prayer. We go up against him in scripture verses. We need to be equipped with the Holy Spirit. And in order to be connected with the Holy Spirit, we got to know the word of God. 
we got to know what scriptures to pull out and to throw it as a shield for the dumps that come up against us. We got to know that the Lord is my shepherd. He is your shepherd. He is my shepherd. It says, and I shall not want. We have to know that God is our shepherd. Amen, my friends. Stop declaring war on yourself. Now that you know that's what you're fighting against. Declare war on the enemy. And in order to declare war on the enemy, we need to equip ourselves with every single key that was mentioned this morning. We need to equip ourselves and be covered head to toe with the honor of God in our daily walk. Because I'm gonna tell you this, the devil don't give up. The devil don't wait until you ready. He don't even listen to you. He coming at you in every way, which way and angle that you go, that he can. You wanna rise up above it? Equip yourself. Know the scriptures. Know that it's real in your life. Stop questioning the scriptures when you read them. But ask God to show you it in your daily life. Because he can. And know that he is your shepherd. God is your shepherd. He is mine. And I know he is yours. Amen, loved ones. Don't declare war. Calm the storm. Amen. Father God, I come before you right now, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for letting us know who we are fighting against. And let us now declare freedom in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father God, that as the word have brought forth to the people, Lord Jesus, that they may hear your voice, that they may know, and that they may be equipped with the scriptures that they need, and be covered from head to toe with the armor of God, walking alongside and holding the Holy Spirit with them, Lord Jesus. So that he may fight on their behalf, Father God. And let them know that every way they go, every person they touch, Father God, you are always with them and never left them alone. That you are their Jehovah Jehovah. That you will provide for them. In your precious and wonderful name, amen. Every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go through private pain Living food to fear Laughter hides their silent cries Only Jesus hears People need the Lord
the grief they bear They must hear the words of life Only we can share People need the Lord People joining us here at Ark of Safety Christian Fellowship. Remember, if you're giving your tithes and offering, you can visit us at aoshawaii.com or text the word GIVE to 1-808-518-3793. God bless.